Who wants a bunk bed, Bell? There's never been a better time to sign up for a yearly EPP, Extra Podcast Person Membership, to Real Ghost Stories Online. Right now, when you become a yearly EPP, you'll get one month free membership to our EPP programs. You'll also be able to claim your very own bunk bed bell plus you'll be doing your part to help keep our show on the air it's amazing it's all amazing we feel so much better a show that helps thousands of people worldwide thanks again for uh, providing this outlet and making it so non-threatening feel not so alone with their haunting experiences you guys are amazing um we listen to you all the time become a yearly epp now get a free month of our epp membership and Get your very own bunk bed bell. Hurry though, supplies are limited. If you're currently a monthly EPP, then upgrade your membership now to a yearly membership and get your bunk bed bell and a free month of EPP membership to Real Ghost Stories Online. I think it's important for people to be able to have a place where they can share their experiences and validate them because these things are real. Sign up now to be a yearly EPP at ghostpodcast.com. And thanks for your support. stories online call in your real ghost story now at 855-853-4802 or write in at real ghost stories online.com you are about to enter the world of the unknown and quite possibly the undead this is real ghost stories online that indeed it is and on today's episode the ghost of a murdered woman tries to help solve her case by leaving clues something genetic or sometimes genetic uh, intuition can be a curse rather than a gift a listener believes she has dreams of something she saw in a past life and finally has closure as to why she's had these dreams for years also a young teen is sure that her father just arrived home only when she goes to greet him she's met with dread and locked doors all those stories and more today on Real Ghost Stories Online. Tony and Jenny Bruski joining you once again. Hi. And how are you this fine day? I'm good. How are you? I have too much crap on my desk. Yeah. Every time I clean it, and I cleaned it off last week. I know. I had it like clean, clean. There wasn't anything. But this is kind of where everything goes to die. Yeah. Here in this room. It is. And we need to stop that. I don't know. Uh. It's like envelopes. I mean, it's all stuff I get to when I like. I have like a, a kind of a system where I put certain things, mm-hmm. but I, I I just I end up stacking things. I get mail. I put an envelope here, and then it never gets moved. And then I find some like, oh, I want to work with that, and I set it there. I don't even know what this screwdriver is even for, but I use it for opening boxes. <laughs> yeah, well, it's it's one of those little ones that came with some sort of thing that you had to install kind of like how the nest thermostats come with the little screwdriver it's a little green one kind of like that so it's not that you don't know what what the screwdriver is for you know what it's for but you don't know what item it came with i guess that's accurate yeah i don't i have uh the other week there's uh with the the doorbell there was Uh it came with one of those very specific screwdrivers Uh and i was trying to get it to because it was kept falling off the the thing outside and uh, I was like, well, what is going on? And it said, oh, you need to unscrew this thing to to get it to to work right. Because it was like a little piece that was holding it off. Uh-huh. So I'm like, oh, okay. So I thought, well, I, I got to have a bit for this in the drill kit. Just no. Not remotely. It's like this very proprietary special screw. And I couldn't find And I was like, well, I, I don't know if I still have the uh, the thing for it. So I looked it up. I'm like, okay, I think I've seen that. It was an orange one, and I found it. I found uh-huh. the actual screwdriver <laughs> right away, too. It didn't even take much digging. I was kind of proud of myself for being able to to find that amongst just boxes of parts. Uh-huh. Well, there you go. Yeah. Save your parts when you when you get <laughs> stuff, because you never know when it's going to come in handy. I, I, I've had that before with things where it's like, I'm never going to use this again and gone. And then it's like, oh, that only worked with that. Except for prefab furniture. Every single piece yeah. of prefab furniture comes with an Allen wrench. Then you don't need it. If it's an Allen wrench, toss it. I, I agree. Have one good set of Allen wrenches. Yeah. But beyond that, uh, when it, if it comes to like a special screwdriver, mm-hmm. sometimes there's a reason for that. Uh, 855-853-4802 is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online. And if you don't do that, you may end up asking the ghosts around your house. 
Can you help me find that uh, that screwdriver? And then suddenly it's just sitting on the coffee table. They're the probably day. the reason it's missing in the first place. It could be. Although we have had stories where sometimes they're like, I can't find this. I can't find that. And it, they, they didn't really know if it was the ghost or not. But suddenly it seems to have shown back up. That's true. So sometimes I think they can be helpful. Yeah. They're like, I'm around the house all day just going through walls. I know where everything is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But there you go. That's the type of ghost I want to have. Uh, Ava writes in, it was a rainy April day. My mom had asked me to bring the horses off the pasture and into the barn. I was in the pasture when I suddenly noticed a white plastic bag tied to our wooden fence with a sock. There was something inside, but I couldn't tell what it was from where I was. I walked over, picked up the bag, looked inside, cuts out, cutouts from a newspaper. But not just any cutouts, about a murder report. Run up to the house to tell my mom, and as soon as I get inside, I show my mom. Right when she sees it, I see a look of nervousness and fear spread across her face. I ask if she, if she knows what's going on and why this bag is here. And who put it there? She tells me to sit down and says that our neighbors received eight of them. Inside of theirs was cutouts about a murder, too, including one about the unsolved murder of an old lady who used to live on our street. She lived alone, and her husband had passed away year, a year ago. The people who got the eight bags were the people who moved into her house. She also said the neighbor got very frightened and called the police. The police were not able to do anything because they said they had no evidence of who did it and why. Neighbors immediately set up security cameras to try to catch anyone doing it. A week later, they came over to our house looking very frightened. They tell us they caught multiple videos of somebody putting the bags up, and they showed us footage you saw the bag moving towards the fence, looking like it was floating. But you eventually realized there was something or someone there. But it was not normal. The person was almost transparent in a ghostly white. The man who received the bags was luckily working in the movie industry, which made it easy for him to enhance the photo. When he showed us the enhanced photo, it shocked us. For the person in the footage was a lady who was murdered. The weird part was that she was wearing a bathrobe. The same footage repeated the whole week, and it was all the same time. Old lady came every night at midnight. When they called the police, the police couldn't figure out if it was really the lady. And to this day, the mystery of the little old lady in the bathrobe remains unsolved, and I still get chills at night when I hear a slight sound. What were her intentions? Here's a question I can't seem to get out of my head. I think she's trying to help solve her murder. I mean, that's... The clues were all things that pertain to her murder. Whether the police already knew them or not, she's not going to know that. She's yeah. just providing whatever she can. Or I'm wondering if there's something in those articles that that answer this question. Mm -hmm. That she's bringing those, those to them to go, look, the answer is here. Mm -hmm. It's in here. And it's, it's being cons uh, consistently overlooked. That would be my guess. Yeah. I would just not want to suddenly have possession of all these things that pertain to a murder nearby. Oh, why not? That seems like a lovely thing. Because <laughs> you never know. It's going to be a new box service. Yeah. You know, like there's there's boxes for everything. There'll be a box for, hey, you can get murder-related items. Yeah. These are things that we found uh, at the crime scene and uh, have now been dismissed. Whatever I mean, the Evidence like that, that just gets destroyed eventually if it's not being used anymore. Or does it go into a file? Or what, what is someone who works in, in police business could probably answer that question. I don't know. At some point, I'm not saying like fresh things, but things that are God knows how long. Maybe it's, it's a crime that's been solved. Mm -hmm. Sentencing has been done. There's no contesting it. It's just it's done and over. Uh, what what happens with the evidence? Is it just destroyed? I would think that it's hung, it, that they hang on to it for quite some time. Sure, but I'm, I'm wondering, like, once that, I would think there's a time window on that mm -hmm. of where it's like, okay, now we're gonna. I don't know. I, I could be completely wrong, but I'm wondering if, if, uh, if once that time period expires, that right there is the items that go in the, the box service. Well, the thing is, you know, people. <sighs> There's people that are convicted for crimes, mm -hmm. and then they go back years later and re-examine the evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe that hasn't necessarily been in the appeals process. So you would think it's a lot of evidence. They though. just have to keep it. But I don't. I don't know that. I would love to know. I don't know. If if at some point it's dismissed or something like that, 
I, I don't know. What, and I'm not saying the evidence that they do hold on to for that reason, stuff that's done. Uh huh. Like, there you go. That's the box service. You get you're like, oh, look at this. I got a glove with blood on it. And you don't know what you're getting every month. It's just uh, random items from crimes that have been solved sure. or, or finished. And so I kind really... of have a story that kind of pertains to this a little bit. <laughs> How are you tying into this? Well, in one of my past jobs, one of my first, let's say one of my first jobs doing design. Okay. I worked for a company and the the police department in Wichita, they anytime they need something, they have to send out, get three bids, even if they already know who they're going to go with. Mm -hmm. We were one of the companies that got asked to please bid on some window treatments for one of their buildings. Okay. And I knew we weren't going to get it because we were going to be more, you know, we were going to be higher priced than people want to pay. Anyway. Sure. We hardly ever sold window treatments. So I went down there because my boss told me I had to, to do the measurements and work up a bid on it. Mm-hmm. I go down there. I kid you not. It is the evidence warehouse. Ah. So I go into this big warehouse with concrete walls and they want blinds for these windows that are way the fuck up high. <laughs> and I'm surrounded by murder weapons and things that have been used in crimes and things that were stolen and recovered. Uh huh. Talk about a weird energy. Yeah. Yeah. It just boxes and boxes and larger things that they couldn't put in boxes, just out swords, uh -huh. lots of stuff. They had most of the guns behind a cage. Sure. But it was like, or I'm sure they had all the guns behind a cage, but there was all kinds of things that could have been obviously used as a weapon because they were used as a weapon just lying around. And it's like, yeah, I'm just going to make up measurements and send over a false bid because this is bullshit. <laughs> So I didn't did you? I didn't tell them that, but okay. I, I guesstimated it because I didn't even. You have couldn't a, get there. I didn't. I didn't even yeah. have a tape that was long enough to try yeah. and run it up the wall and measure sure. these windows. And I was like, "We're not going to get this anyway. They yeah. just totally need to go to Target or something." Yeah. Wow. This is about 10, 11 years ago. I know they have auctions like for like recovered things. Uh huh. Um, I'm just wondering if if that's only for just recovered things or if uh, evidence ends up going into some of that stuff as well. Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I was glad that the it was a, a female officer. She stayed in there with me because I was like, I'm not staying in here alone. This is weird. There you go. Policeauctionchit.com. And it's it's just stuff that has been gathered at police auctions, you know, smaller trinket stuff uh -huh. that you can put in a box and ship it. And you never know what you're getting, but it's stuff recovered from police God. auctions. It probably exists. It's a terrible idea. I've seen there was a website I was on not that long ago where it was um, just like linking you to like all the the box of the month club type uh -huh. services, and. I had no idea there were so many. We're talking thousands yeah. of them. And only so many, you know, I think last and rise to the top and are really quality. You know, like your good ones, like Blue Apron and stuff. Yeah. Um, but there are, there's almost like a box for everything. <laughs> it's a, People, I think, discover there's a way to make money at this. And then it's gotten like oversaturated. I think that's going to be something we look back on 15 years from now, 10 years from now. And I think there'll still be a handful that still work and are still, I think Blue Apron, things like that are going to last. Sure. Um, but I think the the novelty of the just random box stuff is going to, to wear out eventually. Yeah. And there'll be, there'll be very specific ones, but not like a thousand of them. Right. No, no, that's my thought. 855-853-4802 uh, is our phone number here at Real Ghost Stories Online to share your real ghost story with us. Maggie writes in, I come from a long line of intuitive women. I shall not go into the history, but start my story about 11 years ago in 2006. It was October 2006 when I noticed that my sister, who was born with Down syndrome, had a blue tint to her lips. I knew, though, I don't know, uh, don't know how, that this meant she was not receiving enough oxygen. I advised my mother of this, and luckily my sister had a doctor's appointment a few days after then. I was working at my job. This was on October 13th, my daddy's birthday, and my mother called me up on break and told me that my sister was put on oxygen. After we hung up, I could feel a panic attack coming on because I knew my sister was going to die. Fast forward to October 30th, my dad found my sister dead. She died in her sleep. 
Approximately seven years later, there's an interesting story about the number seven in my family, but I digress. I woke up to find my dad on the floor. He, in the middle of the night, had a stroke. When he went to get up, he fell. He laid in a hospital bed for a week and was transferred to a nursing home for recovery. It was Sunday, May 31st, and Mom and I needed to go to church for the evening service. Dad had organized a function, and we, Mom and I, were on the social committee, so our presence was needed. Mom and I were saying our goodbyes for the night, all the while I was having this nagging feeling that I wanted to stay. I knew something was going to happen. We went to church, home, and went to sleep. Mom received a call about 5 in the morning. We arrived at the nursing home to discover that my dad had passed away. Fast forward to April of 2015, I was still living at home with my mom, and this night, mom went to sleep at approximately 9.30. I was sitting at the desk when a feeling came over me to look at the time. It was 11.30, exactly. A feeling came over me. I started crying, and I knew that someone was going to die. I did what my mother always told me, and I prayed. I prayed that God would protect my family, and I prayed without thinking that it wouldn't be my mother. After what felt like an eternity, but was really only a few minutes, I stopped crying and went to sleep. The next morning, like normal, I woke up, got the mail, checked in on my mother, completely forgetting about what happened the night before, and went back to my room. I stayed in bed until my internal clock told me I should hear something. I don't know how to explain it. I went to my mother's door and looked in at her. Something seemed odd. I'd done the same routine hundreds of times before, but this seemed different, almost unreal. I crept in. I had done before to see if I could see the rise and fall of her stomach. Mom always had shallow breaths, but this time I couldn't see the rise and fall. I stood beside her bed, still not seeing the rise and fall of her stomach, slowly reached down and touched her stomach. It was hard and ice cold. I say ice cold, but, I, I, but ice never felt that cold. I lifted her arm, and it was stiff. Mom was in complete rigor mortis. I had predicted the death of my mom the night before. A few weeks after my mother's death that was going through the stuff in the house, I had put an old sewing box that my grandmother had owned on a trash can. Later that night, I began crying and telling mom, I don't know what I'm going to do. But 10 minutes after I stopped crying and had calmed down, the sewing box fell. I went there, picked it up and began go going through the content. One of the things I found was my mother's journal. Only about 10 pages were filled down, but the gist of it was she wanted to be happy and I was a bit lazy. Yes, this is true. She was proud of me, and I was stronger than I knew. I must go, but I did want to share. If there are any typos, I apologize. My computer died, and I'm typing this on my phone. Sincerely, Maggie in Albany. And I think that you never probably would have found that diary if it... I mean, because I guess who stores a diary in a sewing kit unless you don't want it to be found? So Sure. It was kind of meant for her to find it. And I think the mom probably helped that. I agree. I think it was one of those things where there was a reason she found it and she needed that little bit of inspiration, yeah. if you will, at that moment in time. And that just happened to be where it all, it all worked out. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing that experience with us. If you like our program, by the way, please consider becoming an EPP, extra podcast person. You sign up for that on our website, which is ghostpodcast.com. That's what really supports the show and keeps it on the air more than anything else. $5 a month is all we ask. It gets you access to all of our bonus episodes of the program. Brand new one every single week at ghostpodcast.com and access to our archive of all of them as well. Up to about 180 some of them now. So do check that out and uh, and enjoy only five bucks a month or you can sign up for a full year and get one month free and a bunk bed bill it's all there at ghostpodcast.com trisha writes in hi brewskies i'm trisha from minnesota big fan of your show i've been listening for about a year and a half now i'm just getting caught up on your older shows now and i'm thinking of becoming an epp well this isn't really a paranormal experience but it's a story i thought you may enjoy in your show I won't mention any names in it because I don't want anyone mad at me that I didn't get everyone's permission or disclose to disclose their names. One Halloween night, I think it was 2010, I was at a party with some friends. We thought it'd be fun to sit around the bonfire in the backyard and tell some ghost stories. Someone must have been planning a story, the, uh, planning on the story time because they brought a book entitled Ghostly Tales of Minnesota. There's one there called Grandpa's Hand, where the storyteller's grandpa had his hand cut off in a farming accident when he was younger. They buried the hand in a cemetery in Worthington, Minnesota. 
However, they didn't think it mattered on how the hand was buried. Even after his arm stump was healed, he still felt as if his hand was there, and it was very uncomfortable. The feeling of the ghost hand was normal, as in other cases, the nerves still feel like something is there, like an itch that needs to be scratched, even though nothing is in fact there. Lucky for him, someone heard about his ghost hand troubles and the real hand was buried, so they suggested to him that they dig it back up and place it back in with the palm facing down. They did dig it up and sure enough, the hand was lying palm up. Once they had laid it to rest palm down, he had no more trouble with his hand. Funny thing about this story for me was the girl who was also there listening to the story realized that she had heard this story before and that the grandpa in the story was a relative of hers her great uncle. She and all of us were surprised that the story was in fact a real ghost story. Hope you enjoyed this story and I hope to hear it on your show soon. That's not uncommon that, I mean, I don't know, obviously from experience, but that's not uncommon for amputees to feel their lost Mm -hmm. limb, hand, appendage, whatever, after it's gone. It's the nerve endings. Sure. But the whole digging it up and flipping it over is interesting because it makes you wonder (laughs) if that's kind of an urban legend that's been you know passed around since i made it into a ghost book i i've not heard that one before oh i thought you were gonna say it's not uncommon to dig up a hand once it's been buried in the ground and then uh put it uh facing downward no because i think everybody knows that that you're supposed to do that when you bury an appendage that you have from someone i just don't even know what to say i I, i'm i'm confused i mean this is just like they teach you that like in health class they do not like if you ever happen to be in a situation where you have someone's hand disembodied from the the person and you bury it make sure it's facing down otherwise they're going to have that itchy hand thing that was not at all what we were taught in health class. That's what they taught us. And they, they skipped the whole sex ed part, oh. but they taught us about what to do uh, with appendages. Uh, should you have uh, limbs? I could say something on not hand to what limbs the, on hand limbs. on hand. That's nice. <laughs> what are you going to say? Nothing that I keep in mind. This is a school roughly 60 miles from Dahmer. So this is uh, maybe it's just part of health class. They did not. They never said that. But it is roughly 60 miles from Tom. Well, I know that, but they, no. The only thing I ever learned in health class is if you accidentally cut something off, you're supposed to, like a thumb, you're supposed to put it in a glass of milk till you can get to the hospital to see if they can reattach it. Milk? Yes. Not ice? Milk. What's up with the milk? I don't know if it's because it's pasteurized, it's sterile. Google that while we do the next story. Yeah, I don't I don't that, know why, but I swear to God, that is what I was told. You put it in milk. Okay. I'm wondering if that's the Kansas. Was this Kansas or this was, was this a, Texas? No, okay. this was the Kansas education okay. moment. I'm just wondering <laughs> if it may have something to do with it being a Kansas education moment. Google that for me. I've never, ever heard that. I could be, you could be completely right. Okay. But doesn't it stand out to you as being, right. I, it might seem That's off. why I remember it, because it's so weird. I've always heard the ice, you know, where like people like go to the emergency, like, oh my gosh, I got my toe chopped off when I was gardening or something. And then it's like, so well, Jenny determines if you should soak your appendage in milk or water or ice, we'll read this next story. And we'll have the rest of that story after this. Nicole writes in, Hi, Tony. I've been listening to you guys for about a year now, and I love your show. I've had a few things happen to me in my life that cannot be explained, and listening to your show helps me feel that I'm not alone. This is not so much a scary story as it is a spirit story. Two years ago, my cat Patches passed away. He was 17 years old, and I was 22. He was my best friend. I truly adored him, and he clearly adored me. He'd sleep on my head, make me laugh, always wanted to be near me. The day came that we had to put him down, and although it was a very hard decision, I knew it was the right one. He was suffering from large cell lymphoma. During the final drive to the vet, I looked over it, peeled off a small piece of tape from his kennel that had his name on it. I folded it up and put it in my shoe as a keepsake since I knew I wouldn't be taking patches home this time. While we were at the vet, I took my shoe off and checked to make sure the piece of tape was still there. 
That night, I was in my room, an absolute mess, when I remembered about that piece of tape. I went to my shoe and stuck my hand in there, and there was nothing there. For good measure, I checked my other shoe, then all my shoes, and nothing. Checked the floors of my house, my socks, my coats, everywhere, hoping I'd find this item. It was gone. Heartbroken, I gave up and didn't mention a word of this to anyone. Three days later, I was on my way home from work, thinking about Patches, dreading walking into a home without a cat. And in the moment of desperation, I said aloud to myself, if I find this piece of tape, I'll know it's you. I must stress that I looked everywhere, places that I had no business of being. I checked for the exact reason that I, that if I did find it one day, I know that it had to be otherworldly. When I came home from work, I went straight into my room, said hi to my dog, walked into the living room where I sat and cried for a few minutes, then headed back into my room. And that's when I saw it, the piece of tape. In the middle of my room, in the middle of my floor, I burst into tears. But this time it was happy tears because regardless of what anyone says, I know that this was Patches reaching out to me to say hello from the other side. I think it is, you know, just she scoured the house for that mm-hmm. piece of tape. Sure. And then something, maybe it wasn't the, the cat, but maybe something found it and put it where she would find it. I agree. I think there was something there there to that. So Jenny and the update on should you soak your ripped off finger in milk or ice? I, I'm honestly not the only person who was told this at some point because it's it's all over okay. the internet. But it's kind of half say yes and half say no. So I don't know if you should or shouldn't. Mm-hmm. I think you just call 911 as soon as you cut something off and see what they tell you to do. What's WebMD say? <sighs> I don't know. Because I know you're, you're probably finding different. But I'm like, wonder if there's like any reputable site that could say, yes, you should indeed soak this in milk or ice. Okay. More on that after this. Michelle writes in, hello, Jenny and Tony. On a recent episode of Real Ghost Stories Online, you were talking about dreamscapes and revisiting familiar places in your dreams. I wanted to tell you about my experience with this. As a child and into my adult years, I used to dream about the Statue of Liberty quite often. For example, as a kid, I might be dreaming about playing on the lawn, or I'd look up and see the statue way off between the trees. As an adult, I'd be dreaming about walking to work, and she'd be peeking up between the buildings. But the interesting thing was that I always saw her from the same angle. It even got to where I would look for her in my dreamscape. It was always comforting to me to see her there. I grew up in California, so I found this especially strange. My mother said I'd eventually learn why I had this reoccurring dreamscape. Finally, at 38, I took a trip to New York City. Part of my tour included a trip to Ellis Island. While on the island, I looked over at the Statue of Liberty. I realized the view I had been seeing of the statue was the same as I had dreamed my whole life. The hair literally stood up on the back of my neck and my stomach did a flip. My daughter was with me and saw my face change as if I'd seen a ghost. She looked in the same direction as me and said, Oh my gosh, Mom, just like in your dreams. Let me say that I am a true believer in reincarnation, and I'm convinced that I visited Ellis Island in the past, in a past life, possibly as an immigrant. Maybe this was such a significant experience that I carried it into my next life. Nothing else happened to me that day on Ellis Island, but I've not dreamed about the Statue of Liberty since, 17 years later. Anyway, my explanation for uh, for your familiarity with your locations is your dreams is that you've been there before in a past life. Love the podcast. I have a bit of co- a commute to work and it makes the ride much more enjoyable. I'm an EPP. Keep up the great work. You know, that's interesting because she wouldn't have ever had that view mm-hmm. if she hadn't gone to Ellis Island. And it's making me wonder, was something trying to get her to Ellis Island or... And because bleh, the reason I'm asking that is because the dreams stopped after she went there and mm-hmm. she saw that that view. She sure. never dreamt of that again. Mm-hmm. So it's making me wonder if maybe the point was to get her to New York. Get her to be there. Yeah. Maybe there's a ghost relative that's on the island. I don't know. That, that was from the former life or something and, and that's wanting to be seen again. And, you know, the, I, I kind of follow along and agree with the former life part, too. It's just interesting that 
she was somehow supposed to be there and then those dreams stopped. It's like that mm -hmm. was closure. It is. Yeah. Thank you for the story. What's the latest on the finger? Okay. Uh, it says to gently rinse off dirt and debris. Don't scrub it. Uh, wrap it with dry, sterile gauze or cloth and put it in a plastic bag and um, keep it cool, but not cold. Not You don't want to no ice nerve damage. Okay. Um, it does not say anything about milk. So does like 2% works better than whole. You know what? Buttermilk if you have it. I am sorry. Shit I was told <laughs> in school that was inaccurate is still stuck in my head and it comes out sometimes. Was that health class? Yes, that was health class. Oh, wow. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so I don't make shit up like that. That was something I was told. Bravo, Kansas education system. I think I would have had a better health education had I just watched <laughs> ER. <laughs> I mean, seriously. You probably would have. Yeah. You probably would have. All right. Well, there we go. I'm glad we've settled that. Now I'm not going to break out the 2% should we... Uh, Seriously, if I had not just Googled that, if our kids had lost a finger, I would have stuck it in milk. I, I would have. I wonder how often, and, and one of our uh, listeners who works in, in the healthcare field can probably answer this question, and I'd love to hear it. How often do you have people show up with something like that in milk? And yeah. you're like, you, you're not supposed to put it in milk. That's not a good idea. But they're like, just, just like you, they're like, yeah. that's what they told us and health class or, right and this was middle school health class i wonder how often that happens i don't know i'm interested to hear that i'm gonna get a barrage of emails now saying don't do that well we know that now we, i know oh like you're saying like someone is going to have sent that in in the the window between us answering it and and while they're listening to the show there's a good 10 minutes there between you yeah. saying that and then answering the question so yeah there we go well now we know do, 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 do. I'm not doing any more of your stupid and more you know moments on the show. <laughs> yes, yes, we are. <laughs> oh. That's how we all learn. <laughs> That's how we become better individuals. Okay. And more educated not to put ripped off appendages in buttermilk. I never said buttermilk. 2%? I don't know. 1%? Just read the stories. Whole? We have a lot of show left to get through. Brenda writes in. Hi, Tony. Just started listening to your show and wanted to share a story about my grandma. Before my grandma passed away, she was living in an assisted living facility. We knew she was starting to lose her mind because she would tell us stories we've heard our whole lives, but she'd get the details or the names mixed up. Being 82 years old, we didn't think too much of it. She didn't believe in ghosts, so it was surprising when she told me she woke up from a nap once a day and saw a black figure at the foot of her bed. She knew, or she said she knew it was death and she told it to go away. She wasn't ready yet. Grandma was the kind of person who had to take care of everybody else. She made sure the other seniors in her apartment building were taking their medicine. She's, uh, she'd do blood sugar tests for those whose hands weren't steady enough or whose eyes were too bad to see. She drove the others to the doctor's appointments, and once a month she'd organize a community meal for everyone in the building. She loved to cook. You couldn't go to grandma's without being offered something to eat. She did this for everybody. Once she moved into assisted living, it was her turn to be taken care of, although that didn't keep her out of the kitchen. At once a week, About once a week, you could find her in the kitchen helping the staff bake treats for the residents. The day she passed, she was in the kitchen baking cookies. After she was done, the nurses took her back to her room so she could lay down before lunch. When the staff brought her lunch to her room, they found she had passed in her sleep. When my dad and aunts were making the funeral arrangements, they met with a florist and requested a floral arrangement in the shape of a cross with a rose for each of her grandchildren and great-grandchildren, 19 in total. This agreement or this arrangement was to be placed on the inside lid of the casket. The florist said they couldn't do that because it would be too heavy to stay in place. Just after she said that, the potted plant that was hanging from the ceiling behind where the florist was sitting dropped to the floor. Everyone in the room stopped for a minute. Startled by a sudden bang, my dad said it was like Grandma was putting her foot down and telling them that's what she wanted, and she better get it. After the initial shock wore off, the florist looked at my dad and said, we'll make it happen. A few days after the funeral, I was getting my daughter ready for bed, and she was two and really didn't understand that great-grandma was gone. At the funeral, she kept saying that great-grandma was just sleeping. As I was getting her ready for bed, 
She happened to look out the bedroom window, smile, and wave, and said, Hi, Great Grandma. And asked her, I asked her where she saw Great Grandma, and she pointed to the window and said, Right there. I wasn't sure if she was seeing my reflection and thought it was my grandma, or if she was really seeing something. I wasn't. She continued to wave out the window for a little bit, and then said, Bye bye. I asked her if Grandma was still there, and she told me she was gone. I have no doubt that Grandma had come to check in on us that night, as my daughter was too young to make it up. Even in death, she was still taking care of us. That's interesting. She wanted that plant to go with her. <laughs> <laughs> I guess if you are dead and you have the ability to let somebody know you want something to go with you, what's it going to hurt? Why not? Yeah. How do you get the plant to cross over, though? Yeah, I don't know. That could be difficult. Yeah. Do you want to get buried with anything? Just the normal stuff like clothes and my wedding rings and stuff. Nothing else? No. Uh, Nothing weird? No. Laptop? No. No, because I'm not going to be answering emails on the other side. Cell phone? No. I bet people start getting buried with their phones soon. The way, I, I don't want to be buried with my phone. The way that that's become such a like a, a, a part of us where we can't ever detach from it. Mm -hmm. That will be something where it's like, oh, this was his favorite, his first iPhone or something, you know, something like that. Yeah. I don't know. I just want to make sure I have Wi-Fi down there because that could be kind of a pain. You because worry that, about that. Okay. I will. I will. <laughs> That would be an interesting feature at the funeral home mm -hmm. where it's like, and this casket's Wi-Fi enabled. <laughs> and just see. Some people would probably buy that shit. They would be like, oh, great. Yeah. <laughs> just in case. Just in case. Uh, it'd be a, that would be a great prank phone call today to make <laughs> to the funeral home going, <sighs> my, uh, my uncle just passed, but. He was a web developer, and um, we really want to make sure that um, the casket has uh, is Wi-Fi enabled, um, and and at good speeds too. Like, what do you have in that line? <laughs> just see, just see what the uh, the uh, the casket store has to say about that. Yeah, I, I bet someone would be like, "Oh, we can make that happen." Probably. <laughs> just plop a router in there. Eight five five eight five three forty eight zero two. Is our phone number Sherry writes in always feeling like something is always around me as far back as I can remember growing up. I'll start back when we moved from Topeka, Kansas to a small town south of Topeka. Although I don't remember this, my mother said my sister and I saw two ghosts in the new house. We named them Fred and Annabelle, not knowing exactly why, but I always was scared to be in the house by myself. Too old to be at a babysitter, too young to drive and fill my summer days at the pool or at Grammy's who lived a few blocks away. Sometime during the summer before I started junior high school, I became more involved in my piano lessons and practicing at home. One day I decided to go to the basement to look through an old piano bench to find older piano music I wanted to practice. My dog that I had only had for about a year always went with me and followed me downstairs. Suddenly I hear my dog growling and looking up at the stairs. Then I heard it. The sliding glass door opening and closing, and then footsteps from the back door to the top of the basement stairs. At first, I, first I thought, "Shoot, Dad is home now. I can't play the piano anymore because he'll want me. He'll want to watch TV." And I tried to tell my dog that you better stop growling and barking. He already pooped in Dad's shoes, and he'll really be upset if you're barking at him. So I proceeded to go back upstairs from the basement. I had to try to coax the dog to come up with me, but he wouldn't come. He really wanted to just stand there at the bottom and look up at the stairs. Got into the living room, and it was dead quiet. I could feel the hair standing up on my arms and my neck, and I felt sick to my stomach. I hollered out at Dad with no answer. I went to look for him and only found an empty house. I then went into the kitchen to find the sliding glass door still locked and no vehicles out back where they normally parked. I became even more chilled and sick to my stomach, and fear just took over my body. I unlocked the door, left it open in case my dog ever decided to come upstairs and could get out of the house because I wasn't waiting on him. I just ran. I ran so hard, so fast to my friend's house, barefoot, and about eight blocks away from where I lived. I called my mom to tell her where I was and what happened, and if she could please pick me up after work. I wasn't going back there by myself, not for a while. Even as I got older, I didn't like to go to bed until mom or dad got home. I'd rather sleep on the couch. 
Through the years, pictures on the walls would always be hung crooked, even though you just straightened it the day before. And the most visual thing that would happen is the touch lamps would go uh, would go in the living room, would go off as if someone touched them to go off. My mom would just say, Fred, stop it. Fred was blamed for everything. Mom has since passed away, and it's just down there. He spends time with my sister in Arizona during the winter. My husband and I stayed there a month while he was gone until our house was ready to move into. To this day, you can still hear noises, the sliding glass door opening and shutting, and my husband, the skeptic, heard it this time, too. <laughs> I'm sorry. I get stuck on the dog pooping in dad's shoes. Yeah. <laughs> That's hilarious. Okay. Well, the dog obviously knew something bad was upstairs. He wasn't going to come out. Mm -hmm. And she did good by getting out of the house, but it makes you wonder if that was just a residual or if something bad was going on upstairs as far as something that mm -hmm. she shouldn't have interacted with. Or something conscious. Yeah, because she ma it made her sick. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if, if sometimes just the energy itself, if you come into direct contact with it, good or bad, mm -hmm. could have that sort of an effect on you. Yeah. Just the overwhelming feeling of it, just something off. If you're sensitive, probably. Yeah. Thanks for sharing that. Jay writes in, hello, in your episode, Banshee Bird, released April 17th of 2017. The first caller, Alyssa, described an experience she had with a vanishing SUV in the Albany, New York area. She stated that you don't get very many stories from her neck of the woods. She's right. Her statement convinced me to write in and tell you my story. I grew up in Vermont in a town about two hours away from Albany. In 1997, I was eight years old and a member of a local Girl Scout troop. We held our meetings in a house that was built in 1789 by one of Vermont's lieutenant governors. This house was also a stop on the Underground Railroad during the 1800s. In addition, was built onto the house much later. On one particular evening, my troop was having a sleepover, and it was in the addition we were in, that we were to sleep in. The women's bathroom was located in the addition, but it was adjacent to the original house. On with the story, we started our evening playing a game called Good Stranger, Bad Stranger in the room in the old part of the house. The premise of this game was to look out into the hallway and watch as two strangers walked by, draw them, and then tell which was the good stranger and which was the bad stranger. I never said I was in a good girl, girl Scout troop. All the girls and counselors, therefore, were looking out into the hallway. Two older men walked by. They were hunched over a piece of paper. One was holding a what one was holding and whispered to each other as they passed. Like good listeners, my friend and I began sketching them. What are you doing? That's not paper for doodling, a counselor yelled at us. As soon as she finished scolding, two older girl, girl scouts passed, one wearing a skirt and sweater, the other in ripped jeans. Only my friend and I saw the men walk by. Much later that night, around 2 a.m., four of us were still awake and two of us needed the bathroom. A different friend and I went into the stalls to do our business. And while we were in our, in our stalls, the sink began turning on and off. And there was banging coming from the wall that was shared with the original part of the house. Naturally, we thought it was the other two playing a prank on us. So we made, uh, so we made to leave the stalls and catch them. But we were locked in from the outside. We crawled under the stalls, turned off the water, but they were still banging on the wall. We ran out of the bathroom and whipped around the corner, and no one was there. When we got back to the room we were sleeping in, there were, there were two other people there, just as we left them. We were pretty shaken up, and we didn't get much sleep that night. The next morning, we were all standing on the front lawn waiting for our parents to pick us up. I looked up into the window on the second floor and watched a shadow move across the room. All the Girl Scouts were out of the building, and there was no cleaning crew or anyone else in the house with us. What's perhaps the, perhaps the scariest thing for me is that in 2010, I was recounting all of this to my cousin, who fancies herself a ghost hunter. She was interested, and while we didn't have access to the inside of the house, I took her to the lawn of the house so she could see it for herself. We were technically trespassing, but no one lives there. She pointed to three windows and said, I get bad feelings from there, there, and there. The first place she pointed to was the woman's bathroom. The second was a room where we played good stranger, bad stranger. The third was a room with the shadow. We were both pretty spooked and hightailed it out. I haven't been back since. Thank you so much for taking the time to read my story and share it with your fans. I love listening and hope this gives you and your listeners food for thought. I can remember some Girl Scout activities that were not 
necessarily wholesome Girl Scout activities. And that makes you wonder if it was just a collection of energy because they were all, you know, together uh-huh. doing this that maybe that kind of stirred up whatever was already in that building. I could see that. Yeah. I think a building like that, I think anything in it half the time is going to stir it up. Mm-hmm. And especially that many people. Yeah. And that much energy from a bunch of, of young girls. Mm-hmm. You know, that could definitely stir it up. So what sort of unwholesome activities did you do <laughs> as a Girl Scout? And nothing really bad. It was just, you know, we were supposed to get badges from doing a camp house and shit like that. And so we did a sleepover in somebody's house and had pizza instead of camp outs. And oh. the things that go along with little girls sleepovers, you sure. know. And, uh, Cutting our, off someone's finger, putting it in milk. Our troop leader was all about bending the rules just to get us our badges, but... It's like, you yes, know. they did that. They had a camp out. It was a camp out in the living room. I guess it kind of works. You yeah. have a campfire in the living room? No. Okay. No. But yeah, I can't think of anything real bad, but I just remember bending the rules and not necessarily being wholesome little Girl Scouts. There so, you go. Yeah. All right. Ashley writes in, hello, Brewskies. I've written in once before and I love your show. I was on a drive home from Colorado when I just listened to the Banshee Bird podcast on Spotify. This is, a, this is like the second Banshee Bird reference we've had I know. in one episode. It's kind of interesting. I think it was the second story where the man was a uh, missionary and had used scripture or his faith to read whatever was taunting him. I've had night terrors or sleep paralysis since I was a sophomore in high school. They're always of demons or shadow people. It had gotten so bad that I was afraid to sleep. I ended up being put on sleep medication. Just knocks me out. I don't dream when I take them. Anyway, so I'd met this guy named Jonah sometime around the age when I was 19. He had been experiencing bad nightmares and paranormal stuff as well. He told me that his mom read him a saying from the Bible, Jesus is my sword and my shield. Jumped to when I was about 21. I was sleeping on my mom's couch when I felt my body go into the air and it just felt like I was slowly flipping like vertigo. The only thing I could think was my mom walking out and seeing me midair and spinning slowly. I was asleep, but I knew what, what it was what was happening. I was tired, so I tried so hard to wake myself up when I thought of Jonah. I said in my head, Jesus is my sword and my shield. I awoke at 3 a.m. gasping for air. Right when I woke up, my front door opened. My mom walked out of her room, asked her if my stepdad had gone out to smoke. She said no. He'd gone to the bathroom. We told him he went outside to check. He thought that maybe him going to the bathroom maybe had suctioned to where the front door opened, but we have a glass door in front of it. I'm not a a very religious person. I have a very hard time wrapping my head around it despite being raised Catholic. However, whenever I have these night terrors, I always say that saying the Lord's Prayer to try to wake me up. What do you guys think? I have a long list of night terrors and hauntings. I hope to hear from you. It's kind of interesting that that worked. Makes you wonder what was trying to get a hold of her. Uh, that that was the that saying the prayers worked. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that it, if it was just like the ghost of Bill who lived down the road, that may not have such a good effect. Yeah. But when it's it's something dark, that's where it seems to have effect. Mm-hmm. Oh. Thank you for sharing that. Mark writes in. I'm an avid listener from sunny England. I've had many paranormal experiences, and we have a lot of ghost stories here in the UK. My most vivid experience happened to me when I was about 12 years old, back in the mid-1990s. My family and I had moved to a small village and lived in a relatively modern house. It's strange because the house we moved from had many paranormal events take place, so you'd expect this new house to be free of any strange activity. I first noticed voices talking in the attic. These would happen during the day. They were like men talking in loud mumbling. This happened a few times, but spaced out over a few months. The next strange event happened when I was in the bathroom and was washing my face. As I bent down to rinse my face, I heard someone whistle in my ear really loud. The last thing that happened in the house before we moved out to another, yes, yet another extremely haunted house. I was reading in bed with my light on. Everyone was asleep, and it must have been the early hours. I could hear glass moving from underneath my bedroom, which was the dining room. I kept kept getting louder, so I woke my father up and told him what I could hear, and I thought there was someone downstairs. My father and I went downstairs and checked everywhere, but there was no one there. My father told me to stop worrying and to go to bed. I went back in my room and carried on reading. I then heard a tapping sound from the floor at the side of my bed, looked over to the side of the bed, and I swear on my life, 
I say a child with bright blue eyes and blonde hair, or saw a child with bright blue eyes and blonde hair coming up to the floor with his hands on his rose red cheeks and his lips puffing and blowing. It was like seeing a human person. I moved back into my bed and gasped. When I quickly looked back, the child was gone. I did not sleep that night, and it was the most intense thing I've ever witnessed. I just wish I knew what it was. He was angelic looking, but it scared the hell out of me. I don't know that it was necessarily angelic. <laughs> yeah, it seems a little off. Yeah, and it's almost like, almost kind of mocking the situation. With mm-hmm. the dad being like, uh, just go back to bed. Mm-hmm. And the thing shows up. I would say it was probably something dark, but I'm glad that that was it. That and that's where it ended. Just something messing with him, too. Yeah, I could, I could possibly see that. Very bizarre imagery mm-hmm. of the, the child rising out of the ground. Thank you for sharing that uh, that story with us. We do greatly appreciate it. All right, there you go. That wraps up today's episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. Thank you guys for listening. If you like the program, you want some more episodes, well, then uh, check out our EPP bonus episodes. Literally uh, about 180 of them up there for you to binge away at it. Ghostpodcast.com. Go there, sign up. Sign up right there on the website. It's only five bucks a month. Or if you're a Patreon user, you now can become an EPP through Patreon as well. Link's right there at ghostpodcast.com. Choose a level that's right for you and then sign up and keep our show on the air. Until next time, for Jenny Bruski, I'm Tony Bruski. Thanks for listening to another episode of Real Ghost Stories Online. <laughs>